Hello, my name is Professor Barrett from the University of Dundee in uh, Scotland. I'm going to talk to you today about a global approach to try and address uh, male reproductive health and how we can develop a better system for investigating uh, male infertility. I don't believe I have any significant uh, conflicts of interest that would change the way that I provide information to you uh, today. So what are the learning objectives of this talk that I'm going to give? Well, first of all, I want us to try and understand a little bit about male reproductive health and why it has lagged behind uh, female reproductive health. I'm then going to discuss how a global collaboration is the, perhaps the way that we can go forward to try and address this gap and these issues. And I'm then going to try and give four examples of where global collaboration will bring us together to try and identify uh, these challenges and make progress. And at the end of that, I'm going to give us what are these global uh, collaborations and how, in fact, can you get involved to try and help us develop male reproductive health. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is where are we now? And the next part is going to be how we move forward in the future. So if we deal with, for example, where we are now, now, we're incredibly lucky in reproductive medicine because basically we're part of a multi-billion dollar industry that is incredibly translational in nature. We have many, many societies that are thriving. For example, ESHRA, uh, ASRM, Aspire, and they are just fantastic meeting places where we can sort of discuss future ideas, etc. And some of the science in our field is, is truly breathtaking and, and outstanding. So, for example, the in vitro generation of germ cells. Uh, hopefully, in, in the next 10 years, that's going to be taken to some reality for clinical treatment. And there have been incredible strides in genetics of reproduction, so that now we can get some real feel for what uh, could be a diagnostic and prognostic indicators. The other thing that is fantastic in our field is the public interest. Everybody is interested in reproduction. So that's just, just great because when you're a scientist trying to sort of translate information to the public, if the public is sort of, you know, we're not very interested, you've got a really uphill task. Whereas in this nature, that's not the case. Everybody's interested in reproduction. So in theory, everything should be pretty, pretty good. Everybody should be pretty happy. Well, that's actually not the case for male reproductive health. Male reproductive health has somewhat lagged behind uh, female reproductive health. And, and I've just put some examples here to give us some guidance. So for example, we are still discussing how many men in various regions of the world are actually infertile. We, we have incredibly limited information on this. Uh, probably about 175 countries in the world we do not have information on this. We're still discussing, for example, varicocele. And, you know, half believe, half don't believe. You know, what, what are we supposed to conclude? And this is sort of 60 years later. Other examples, I think, are perhaps um, equally pertinent. So, for example, we have, we have Semen is a diagnostic cornerstone of male uh, infertility. But apart from that, we have no real diagnostic tests for the men, apart from one or two very small examples. Uh, if we think of sperm DNA, for example, we have more reviews on that subject than primary data. And in reality, there is no real new prognostic and diagnostic information from sperm DNA as an example. And, and often we tend to rush then for diagnostic and treatment tools, perhaps without doing all the necessary experiments in, in the first place. So we come along a little bit of a rocky road for that. And there's two uh, studies that I would suggest uh, if you're interested in reading further. One is from the uh, AUA, uh, with Peter Schlegel and Group, and one is from the WHO. And it's related to the quality of the studies that we have in male reproductive health. So we're lagging behind female reproductive health. And that's where the focus is, I think, we should put our attention. So how are we supposed to move forward? You know, do we keep doing the same? Probably going to end us in the same mess that we're in now. Or do we think about how to do things differently? <clears throat> well, 
one of the one maybe only a uh, positive thing that's come out of the pandemic has shown really clearly to us as, as a global group that basically when we collaborate together when we're focused in how to go forward for the future we can really drive something fantastically well so for example and i'm sure we're all aware of this in 21st of December 2019 was the report of a pneumonia of unknown cause. Less than 12 months later, we have a vaccine produced, for example, by Pfizer, that was 95% effective against COVID-19. That, that time frame to develop that vaccine is, is just, just blows your mind. But it was basically done because everybody collaborated together everybody decided this is what we need to do this is what we need to get organized and they drove forward collaboratively together so what i'm suggesting is that actually we could then learn those lessons and say okay this is where we are on male reproductive health how can we go forward so i wanted to give some examples familiar examples to us of how we can do this and maybe go forward so I'm going to go through four examples, quite simple for this. Let's deal with the first one, which is related to semen analysis. So as I mentioned, semen analysis is the cornerstone for the investigation of the man. We all know sperm count, sperm motility, sperm morphology. You know, we're the, the trio are well known in uh, reproductive medicine. <clears throat> but what is perhaps sort of known, but maybe ignored a little bit, is the fact that actually if we have a diagnosis of a, a semen analysis is done say in Darlington, in Darwin in Australia or in Dar es Salaam in, 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 in Africa, the only thing that we can tell is even if it's the same semen pot that the result will be different and what that really means is that technically for whatever reason and there are many reasons we could talk about uh, at some stage we are unable really to do a high quality semen analysis and this this graph here which which is uh, uh just says it says it all to me this is from the uk meat class where you get one effective pot of semen and you just aliquot it out and then in theory it should all be the same because it's the same pot so we should all get the same result well that's not the case sometimes the man is only spermic and sometimes the man is a sperm donor and it's the same sample and and this this experiment's been repeated hundreds of times showing exactly the same result and it's not just in the UK you know we could say in the UK well you know you guys voted for Brexit clearly you're struggling with things um, it's not true I mean it's the case in America it's the case in Australia it's a case in Germany and this is an example very recently come from the Netherlands what it is is we can count sperm we need to be able to count sperm much better so that's clearly a global problem that we have that we need to come together and try and understand in more detail how we do training programs virtually or whatever and then we can get the same analysis done just using one high quality method and to some degree i think we're lucky because the WHO in 2021 and the ISO set standards in semen analysis and they're much clearer now than they were. And maybe that was a reason for it. I don't think so, but maybe it was part of the reason for it. So what we have here is one standard and one method. So I think that's really, really helpful for us to do that. So I think that's gonna be a big plus. What we need to do is globally work on that and work out different training programs that are the same in the Argentina versus, versus Hong Kong. And we can then train people to do semen analysis appropriately. But of course, then we have to sort of look to the future. You know, semen analysis is using technology from the 1920s, so it's 100 years old. Um, you know, things, things have moved on since then. We didn't have the mobile phone 100 years ago, for example. So maybe at some stage, we have to think about a technological development for semen analysis. And here's a little uh, sperm, uh, an example of how difficult these things can be. Here's a sperm cell going very excited, and then it goes on a linear track, and then it gets excited again, and then it goes on another linear track. And in fact, you know, an analogy I would give is this is like a sperm cell listening to classical music. So it's going here, it's being quiet, and it's not moving very much. And here it's listening to sort of, you know, good old ACDC, a rock and roll event. So 
I, I think it is difficult to do some of these things by eye. So maybe technology will be the future. But we've got to get together and add A and B and get to C, rather than at the moment, we can't even add A and B together. So technology may help us, but we've still got to get these virtual training programs. And that's where that's example num number one. <clears throat> Let's think of example number two. <clears throat> and this is a graph you've probably seen, maybe not in this format, but you've seen in the, the standard press many, many, many times. It's a decline in sperm counts. It's what I call the decline in sperm count story. You know, is it real? Um, of course, this black line looks dr fantastically dramatic. You know, by the year of 2025 or 2035, you know, we're going to have no sperm. So, so <laughs> we're not going to need to worry about global warming because we're just going to have no sperm. Of course, it's not as simple as that. Um, in fact, actually, if you look at some of the other groups, and this is the uh, unselected Western group, if you look at the fertile Western group, for example, there's, there's no change in sperm counts over the last sort of 50 years. So this is a very big debate. It's a very live debate, and it's been a live debate for, for some time. But what's very interesting is that we still don't really truly know the answer. And one example I'll give you in the next slide is, is really where we can try and home in on global data to find out what's happening. So this is a paper from Jacques Auger from, from Paris. And what we have here is this is breaking down this data from Hagi Levine. It's breaking down this just fantastic looking slide that shows a massive decline in sperm counts. And what you see in the United States, Australia, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, etc., there are huge gaps in the data. So, for example, let's look at Southern Europe. There is zero. There's nothing going on. <laughs> no studies <laughs> before 1995. If we look at Australia and New Zealand, there's nothing before the early 90s. If we look at Western Europe, there's big gaps in the data. And what this means is it's very difficult to solve a global problem if we've got huge gaps in the data. What we need to do is come together and plug these gaps. Then we'll be able to tell if there is a clear decline in sperm counts, yes or no. So it won't be a story anymore. It'll be actually fact or fiction. What about number three? Well, number three relates to semen analysis and the reference ranges for semen analysis. So this relates to the new WHO manual, and we have clearly for sperm concentration, sperm motility, and sperm morphology, so-called reference ranges for semen analysis. And this is a, a detailed analysis of the data, uh, which, which Martin Campbell produced, uh, and this data is freely available in the University of Dundee website. And we published the fertile uh, uh, ranges uh, in 2021 in, in, the, in a paper in Andrology. But the details of the fifth centile are quite interesting. So what we see is for sperm concentration, it's say 16 million. For sperm motility, it's 42% motility. And for normal forms, it's 4% normal forms. And, you know, there's a lot of data points here. So 3,000 data points. So we could say to ourselves, well, wow, that's, that's a lot of data. It must be very exciting. So it, it, mu it, must, it must be real. It must, must be fantastic to be able to look at that. But again, when you dig into the data behind this, there are some substantial problems with pulling this data together. So for example, this data is incredibly geographically limited. There is only one study from China. There's only one study from Africa, and, that, and that's from Egypt. And the implication that is the reference ranges just being come from, from Egypt are, are applicable to all of Africa. And clearly that's not true. So although we've got 3,000 uh, people in this uh, reference ranges, we need many more from a much more geographical spread. And we need prospective studies, not retrospective studies. Uh, a simple example, there's no data from South America. I mean, the whole of the continent, and there's no data. So these are massive gaps in data that we can fill if we're thinking in a global way and we're thinking to the future. And the last example I'll give is that, you know, I've been involved in reproductive medicine or male reproductive health, whatever you want to the best terminology, for sort of 25, 30 years. And the male pill has been on the horizon 
every year for the last 25 years and we still don't have it uh we're still waiting so it's like waiting for a bus i mean there's nothing happening no buses are coming and this is incredibly frustrating because clearly the contraceptive choices that are available for couples are very limited and there are severe difficulties with a number of these choices there needs to be much more choice just generally but a big gap relates to the male so we have condoms and we have a setting and there are big problems with both of those of course but we don't have the male pill it still isn't here there's been many attempts to doing this but at the moment it's not there now here i can see some real really truly amazing progress that's going to occur and the example i would give is the bill and melinda gates foundation where they've realized that contraception is a huge global issue and that that is a, a very widespread challenge not just to reproductive medicine but of course to the world and they've committed to spend in about 280 million dollars per year from 2021 to 2020 uh, 2030 to develop new and improved contraceptive technologies and i'd suggest uh, just have a look at this website from the Bill melinda gates foundation they have taken the bull by the horns and they've said right this is a big issue we need to globally look at this we need to get some experts together we need to start funding this area and we need to make some progress in the next 10 years and that is exactly the way that these things should be done but of course it needs vision it needs money and it needs drivers from the top as well as of course from the bottom so what are these networks well up until a few years ago basically there were none <laughs> no surprise uh, and that's why progress has been pretty poor but that's not the case now so there is a, a one group for example the esra male reproductive health initiative which which, which i'm fortunate to be part of but we're, we're with 13 other people and we're just having a meeting in budapest in a couple of weeks to look at the future for male reproductive health so we've set up a pathway strategic pathway which we need to go down for looking at the future for male reproductive health and this includes people like sartu from fertility europe includes scientists includes clinicians includes people from from south america etc etc but that's not the only one um there are for example the eu uh cost which is run by from rafael from barcelona is a training program and also a research program related just to europe there's a, an amazing example in australia where they've got the healthy meal so they have funding from the government uh, moira o'brien and rob mclaughlin for example which is several million dollars to really get at what are the causes of male infertility and how do you pass this to the public how do you give public information related to this it's a very complicated com complicated thing to actually do there are genetic consortium in male reproductive health and this is very important because you know what we have here is that 20 years ago genetics used to be just get a few patients together and do some sequencing those days are completely gone you cannot do that anymore you've got to get large numbers and high powerful collaborations and it's fantastic what what yoris and colleagues have done for the uh for the uh international consortium on, on uh, male genetics there's also another one very recently from Mashok agarwal looking at global andrology form and which looking at pulling to pe people together from different regions so i think there are there are some very recently the last couple of years but there are some really good initiatives where hopefully what we've talked about the challenges that we've had these initiatives can help us really go forward and try and attack some of the problems that i've talked about so if i could summarize uh, ladies and gentlemen what hopefully i've put to you is that male reproductive health uh, reproductive health is an amazing subject to be involved in of course that's that's one of the reasons why you're involved in it um but it's it's male reproductive health has not perhaps gained the same traction as female reproductive health and there's a bit of an illusion of progress it looks like we made progress we've got xc etc etc but you know we haven't really enough the for example there's no pill a man can take not just to, for contraception but to improve his sperm count you know there doesn't exist and you know that, that's a that's a crazy situation to be 
brutally honest. So the way forward to do this is to have global collaboration because it's essential. And the, the example I've given is, is related to the COVID pandemic, how we've really managed to transform things in, 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 in uh, COVID-19. So I think if we follow rigorous rules, global collaboration, high quality science, collaboration between clinicians, scientists, counsellors, politicians, policy makers, etc. from around the world, we can really make some traction. And I've tried to also show uh, individual examples of networks that are actually trying to do that. So hopefully you'll get involved in some of these networks and hopefully in the next five years we'll, we'll see some uh, real fantastic progress. Thank you very much for, for listening.